Uh, welcome to the Choosing Wisely Health Systems Leader webinar. Uh, this uh, represents uh, three uh, organizations and collaborations uh, with Academy Health and Cost of Care. And uh, we have tried to combine several communities that we think should be very integrated in uh, advancing any kind of quality improvement effort, and particularly with overuse, and that is researchers, health services researchers, and medical educators, um, along with people um, in hospitals, health systems, who are trying to apply interventions to reduce overuse. Uh, we will have a presentation uh, by uh, Kaiser Permanente, Southern California, and then we'll hear a response from Neil, and then we'll have a uh, open uh, Q&A mic. Um, so, um, so be before I uh, would turn to presenters, I wanted to take the opportunity to follow up on an email that I sent regarding Consumer Reports' uh, decision uh, to leave the uh, Choosing Wisely campaign in March. Uh, we will continue to provide uh, most of the materials from Consumer Reports developed through the choosingwisely.org site, and we'll be developing new relationships with employer organization and consumer groups and be happy to answer any questions you might have about the transition at this moment. Uh, feel free to contact uh, uh, me or uh, Tim Lynch uh, here at uh, the ABIM Foundation. So I'm gonna uh, go through um, the presenters. Uh, we have uh, six presenters uh, and Kaiser Permanente, Southern California, uh, is gonna be talking uh, about uh, reduction of unnecessary services for particular populations, uh, one uh, elderly, one diabetes, um, and I think they have a fresh approach uh, to uh, this area, uh, not just looking at single recommendations, but looking at uh, specific uh, uh, patients with specific uh, uh, issues. Uh, Tony Lee is the chief of General Internal Medicine at Kaiser Permanent in West Los Angeles and was named the Choosing Wisely Champion last year by the, by the American Geriatric Society. Uh, Thomas McCormick is an analyst with KP Center for Effectiveness and Safety Research. John Adams is the principal senior statistician at the Center for Effectiveness and Safety Research. Beth McGlynn is Vice President Kaiser Permanente Research the director of the Center for Effectiveness and Safety Research, and my boss as chair, board chair of the ABIM Foundation, and a longtime colleague. Michael Cantor is the executive vice president and chief quality officer at the Permanente Federation and the associate dean of quality science at Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine. Tony? Thank you, and thanks for the invitation. So today, um, I'll be talking about interventions um, that we've done at Kaiser Permanente West LA in Kaiser Permanente Southern California that um, is consistent with the recommendations from the Choosing Wisely campaign. I'll talk about the historical basis as well as the projects that I've been involved with. Later, Tom, John, and Beth will discuss whether or not uh, the change in the Kaiser Permanente reference range um, for hemoglobin A1C in older adults with diabetes has influenced how physicians prescribe oral hypoglycemics. And finally, Michael Kanner will talk about how interventions are scaled up throughout Kaiser Permanente. So just for background, Kaiser Permanente Southern California, we are physician owned. We have 4.4 million members. And in Southern California, we have 560,000 Medicare members. We have um, 4,000 Permanente physicians that are spread throughout 12 different medical centers. And the primary consideration in all projects that we embark on is based on improving patient care. So a bit of background about myself. Um, I joined Kaiser Permanente in 1999 after um, completing a internal medicine residency at UCLA Center for Health Sciences and immediately wound up doing the Kenmer Fellowship in General Internal Medicine and later a Geriatrics Fellowship, both at UCLA. So when I was recruited to come to Kaiser Permanente in West LA as a primary care physician that I, work that I continue to do, 
I was also a hospitalist for about 10 or 11 years. Um, I had the good fortune of, um, of having a really supportive chief, um, Jeff Brettler, who asked me immediately to address cares, care gaps in geriatrics that could delay disability. And at the time, I had the full support of Fred Alexander and continue to have the full support of Howard Fullman and the chief nursing executive, Gloria Blackburn. And just for background, in 1999, Geriatrics was still a very nascent specialty. In internal medicine residencies, the geriatrics curriculum was still not mandated. So I still recall between 1994 and 1997, we wound up prescribing diphenhydramine or Benadryl to hospitalized, member, to hospitalized patients for the treatment of insomnia. And this is something that is never done anymore. Also, when I wound up joining um, Kaiser at West LA, we, um, I was involved in a lot of different um, Southern California geriatric focus committees that was led by Nancy Gibbs, who was um, our regional chair for geriatrics for KP Southern California for over 12 years. Nancy's job was really to bring thought leaders together to convene, to share ideas that occurred throughout Southern California Kaiser Permanente. So the first um, um, project that I was involved with to hopefully prevent disability at Kaiser Permanente West LA was, um, was to look at how we addressed falls in our, in our older members. And so we designed an intervention that was based on Mary Tonetti's publications. And this was actually the first time I started really thinking um, really thoughtfully about how prescribing affects potential disability in older adult patients. Later, um, a project that we did at West LA was looking at the appropriate placement of indwelling urinary catheters in hospitalized older adults. And I did a lot of education among physicians, ER physicians, um, internal medicine docs, hospitalists, nurses, that were based on the recommendations on SAINTS publications. We published our thoughts as a review article in the Permanente Journal. And again, this was a way to delay disability in our, in our older adult members. We eventually wound up looking at KP West LA about how we could prevent new onset delirium in hospitalized older adults. And the first time, um, the first thing I did um, to start this campaign was actually do a site visit at Kaiser Permanente Orange County, where Joel Handler, one of our legendary Kaiser Permanente Southern California physicians, started the first delirium prevention protocol based on Sharon Inouye's research. And so here at Kaiser Permanente West LA, we mimicked much of what was done at KP Orange County. We added a couple of other recommendations that Sharon Inouye had had. And many of these interventions were consistent with uh, Chusley Weising uh, recommendations. Eventually, with Michael Cantor's support, Nancy Gibbs, Joel Handler, and I, along with other physicians, other pharmacy um, administrators, and nursing administrators, formed the Geriatric Hospital Safety Committee for Kaiser Permanente Southern California. We had agreements throughout KP Southern California by nursing, pharmacy, and physician groups about how we should try to reduce um, reduce the risk for instant delirium in hospitalized older adults. And we did so by embedding the delirium prevention protocol in our electronic medical record in 2009. And so we published our thoughts in the Permanente Journal about how preventing delirium in hospitalized older adults could lead to prevention of disability and also its links to hospital acquired falls. And again, had the good fortune of having um, editors of the Permanente Journal, Tom, Janice, Max McMillan, and Ian Kimmich to help out. So my involvement um, for the past um, 10 years has mostly been um, mostly focused on medication safety in older adult members. And I recall the first committee that I was participating in was led at the time by Nancy Gibbs. And I think it was about 2002 where Nancy had an ad hoc committee focused on looking at how we could reduce the prescribing of paroxicam, amitriptyline, the butalbital compounds, furanol and furacet, and diazepam or Valium. And it's amazing what influence Nancy had because um, a few years later, the prescribing of these four really highly dangerous medications were minimal throughout KP Southern California. So with Michael's sponsorship in 2009, Nancy Gibbs and I wound up co-chairing the KP Southern California High Risk Drugs and the Elderly Committee that really focused on reducing the use of unnecessary polypharmacy in our older adult members. And though we spent much of the time addressing medications that were scrutinized by the Beers criteria, more specifically the anticholinergic 
and the set of hypnotics, we also recognized that, um, that other medications were also considered high-risk medications. And much of this was based on the Budnitz work. Budnitz was from the, is from the Center for Disease um, from the CDC. And because of this, um, our committee actually changed the laboratory reference range of serum digoxin level in 2010 based on the DIG trials, as well as Budnitz's work that suggested that digoxin was the fifth most likely medication that would lead an older adult to be hospitalized due to a divorce drug event via the emergency room. And again, um, we were so fortunate because we've always had the, um, the support of the KP researchers, Michelle Spence, and also the uh, Tom, John, and Beth will be talking afterwards. Perhaps the intervention that has made the biggest impact for the most number of um, members for KP Southern California, as well as KP Southern California physicians, is um, our review about um, the glycemic control in older members with diabetes. And from a historical standpoint, Carol Mangione and Brown in 2003 from UCLA published guidelines that looser A1C controls were perhaps better for older adult members. And this is confirmed about five years later from the Accord and Advanced trial that demonstrated that tight glycemic control in older members, older patients with significant morbidity actually had worse outcomes than those with lower A1Cs. And this contrasted UKPDS and DCCT that lower A1Cs would be better. So the American Geriatric Society guidelines recommended in 2013 looser glycemic um, A1C goals. And this was in contrast from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, where they were recommending continued strict glycemic controls. But Budnitz from the CDC in 2007 and later in 2011 showed that insulin was the second most likely medication that would lead an older adult to be hospitalized via the ER due to an adverse drug reaction. And in 2011 demonstrated that oral hypoglycemic medications were the fourth most likely uh, medication that would lead an older adult to be hospitalized via the ER due to an adverse drug reaction. So prior to January of 2016 for KP Southern California, our reference range for the goal for um, patients of all ages with diabetes was less than seven. But we wound up having consensus agreement from the primary care physician leads as well as the diabetes leaders through, throughout KP Southern California that we should address a change in the reference range. So in January of 2016, we, uh, we published um, and now use the age-banded hemoglobin A1C reference range in older adults throughout KP Southern California, where for patients between 18 and 64, the goal still remains less than seven. But for the ages of 65 to 75, the A1C goal is now less than 7.5, and for older adult members who are 76 years and older with diabetes, their goal is now less than 8.0. There's a commentary that if an older patient has a lot of morbidity, a looser A1C goal might be appropriate as well. And so we disseminated our guidelines uh, through the Permanente Journal again, and this is consistent with the Choosing Wisely um, uh, recommendations from the American Geriatric Society. So now I'd like to hand it over to Tom, John, and Beth about whether or not um, the change in the KP Southern California reference range has um, influenced how physicians prescribe medications um, in our older adult members with diabetes. Tom. Thanks, Tony. Uh, when there's an A1C that's above the goal, the lab system alerts the PCP with a message in the health record. And so the changes to the reference ranges that Tony mentioned affect the alerts that the clinicians receive from the lab system. So there's a hypothesis that the clinicians are responding to these alerts, and because the, prior to 2016, the alert was A1C over seven for any age group, this might lead to overly intensive medications in older patients. And so to test this hypothesis, we constructed an analysis population of older patients who had A1C results in 2016 and in 2015 before the age-dependent reference ranges started. And we looked in the six weeks following each A1C result for evidence that the clinician changed the patient's dose or the combination of medications that the patient was taking. Uh, 
And we constructed models to compare the likelihood of a medication change in 2016 after the introduction of the age-dependent reference ranges with those in 2015. And we included patients aged 55 to 64 to check for changes in 2016 that weren't related to the age-dependent A1C targets because in both years, that age group had a target of under seven. Um, so for each patient, we constructed the sequence of A1C results and medication orders, and we censored patients after the first insulin order because we couldn't calculate a dose from the data that we had. And we used logistic regression to model the odds of a change in treatment or dose in the six weeks following each A1C. So we could calculate an odds ratio to compare 2016 with 2015. We did create a separate model for each age group. So Tony, if you don't mind moving to the next slide. Uh, thank you. This is just to give an idea of the data that went into the analysis. We had over 200,000 patients and over 700,000 A1C results in the three age groups. Um, of these A1C results, 27% had any medication orders in the six weeks following the result. And 14% of these didn't change the treatment or the dose that the patient was on. So that left us with 10% of these A1Cs that were followed by an intensification of treatment or dose, and 2% that were followed by a de-intensification. So in our preliminary models, we combined intensification and de-intensification into a medication change outcome. And the A1Cs were grouped into the four categories of interest. Uh, A1Cs below seven, nothing changed for either year for any age group. Those are all considered under control. A1Cs above eight, or again, nothing changed between the years. That was always above goal. But then we looked between seven and 7.5, and between 7.5 and eight, where one or both of the older age groups had their reference range change in 2016. Um, and Tony, the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so to, before we get into the details of this, the results are consistent with the hypothesis, hypothesis that the clinicians are changing the medications in response to the alerts based on the new reference ranges. These plots show the odds ratios of 2016 versus 2015 of a medication change, and a value below the 1.0 1, the 1 line means that a medication change is less likely in 2016. So the three cases in which the alerts changed to be based on age-dependent A1C targets are highlighted in orange, and we can see that in 2016, these three age and A1C combinations had, a low, had lower odds of a medication change in 2016 compared to 2015. And the 55 to 64 group where the alerts would have been the same in both years actually had slightly higher odds of a medication change in the two years, in the, in the second year. Um, we did fit additional models to try and separate intensification from de-intensification, but because there were so few de-intensification events that we could, de that we could detect, the, we weren't able to find a statistically significant result. All of those de-intensification odds ratios crossed the 1.0 equals the 1 line, and the intensification-only model produced very similar results to what's shown here. So we see results that are consistent with the hypothesis that changing the reference ranges led to the clinicians intensifying the medications less often in 2016. And that is, I'll pass it on to Michael now. Uh, hello. Uh, nice to be here and um, and talk. I'm going to talk a, a bit about uh, how do we actually spread multiple programs to scale in a large system. Um, our uh, region consists of about 4.3 million members, uh, have uh, 7,000 or so doctors. Um, so every time we make a change, it's actually a, uh, a large issue and we have multiple initiatives going on. And um, a couple thoughts, um, why is implementation and spread difficult? And I think there's two barriers to think about. One is a lack of a systematic approach so that one's not reinventing the wheel and the infrastructure each time a new initiative comes along. Um, and the other is frankly the number of new initiatives and programs. And so um, when one wants to deal with uh, falls in the elderly, one is competing against the other three or 400 programs that are out there. 
um, for attention, bandwidth, resources, etc. And I am having a little trouble on advancing the slides. Um, oh, okay, I guess they moved. Um, let's talk about systems, and I said a systematic approach. You need a system of improving the care. I'd recommend this uh, book by Danella Meadows, but when I talk about a system, I'm talking about interconnected sets of elements that are organized in some way that's uh, coherent and that is designed to achieve something. It sounds a little bit pedantic, but the bottom line is um, you, you need some approach that can be used for multiple programs um, over time. And, um, and the, the next slide here um, uh, would emphasize patients are part of the system. They do most of the work and they're actually the key to scaling and spread. Um, this may seem uh, obvious to some people and counterintuitive, I find it gets forgotten, but at the end of the day, um, we're talking about diabetes, it's actually the patients that have to be the ones changing their medications. The doctors may order it, but the patients do the hard work of complying with the drug regimens and the behavioral regimens. And we shouldn't assume that all patients um, go to the department we think they should go to, and that most of the time the patients are actually not in the healthcare delivery system. Uh, next slide here. Um, here's an example um, just to show you how things are counterintuitive. Um, we looked at patients needed either a mammography or an A1C test and roughly 37, 38% of those folks uh, showed up in primary care and the rest of the time they were contacting other pieces of our delivery system, the ED, specialty care, um, other places where you wouldn't think it's their job to take care of these things, yet if you don't have a systematic approach um, most of the patients needing these elements of care will be in what some might consider the wrong place to get it. And so you need to develop systems that will address the patient, where the patient is, whether they're in the wrong department or they're still at home. Uh, next slide. Uh, we've published this because I can talk for five hours on this. I'd refer people to this article here. Um, to get more details, and over time we've had great results, which is on the next slide. Uh, my point here is um, it's been a sustainable increase over uh, a decade of above average improvement on HEDIS scores, and I just use that because it's a sort of currency we can compare to um, other systems, and the point is you can design a scalable, sustainable system over a long period of time that will perform if you do it. So I'd refer people to that article. I'm gonna, in the next three minutes, talk about it at a very high level on the, the next slide. It's something we call complete care. And uh, here it is. The challenge you can see is we started way back with maybe a couple conditions we managed and off to the right side of the screen you could see um, how this gets complicated if every condition was managed totally separately and every initiative separately, um, this thing would easily collapse, but the concept is a structure common to all of these things um, in here, and I think we're probably managing about four or 500 quality initiatives. I don't think that's unusual for most healthcare systems that people are kind of um, uh, under a burden of a lot of measurements and analytics, et cetera. Um, but I'll, let's go to the next slide. I'll kind of show how, how we've organized this. We call it complete care. On the outside of this uh, wheel, you'll see a bunch of conditions that seem totally unrelated to each other. Um, and on the inner circle is sort of the infrastructure where if you just start at the six o'clock position, pretty much anything you do you need practice guidelines, and the prior speakers talked about creating those guidelines. There's also an educational component to our doctors. Once you set up 
structures to create guidelines, to create education. You can do it for any condition, any um, initiative. It's all the same. So the key is setting up those um, infrastructural pieces. And as you go around the sort of wheel here, um, you'll see other things, health education, set up people expert in educating patients. They'll know how to deliver that. They don't care what they're actually educating about. Um, let me go to the next slide because I think, well, yeah, this is just a list of them again. Um, proactive office encounter is key. As patients come into the office and the prior speaker was talking about medication change and it's something called therapeutic inertia where people may not change medications when they should. You actually need a system where physicians um, systematically look at the patient and see what needs to happen at that visit. That's frequently left to just the cognition and the doctor's mind. We actually have computerized checklists come out of uh, needed or not needed care elements. Um, and that's part of our proactive uh, care outreach is key. If again, we used to do this all separately, but now any initiative we have, there's folks that specialize in how to outreach the patients, send them letters, text, uh, any kind of uh, patient information. Uh, we have a patient portal that patients can come into, again, get information on anything we want to give them. So it's all set up for the next initiative to come in and just plug into that system. Um, EMR decision support is key and uh, an area of challenge for us as well as probably others. But again, uh, often initiatives need to have some kind of decision support or EMR changes. Folks expert at doing that can do it for anything. So I hope you're getting the concept of sort of these functional units that cross um, all kinds of initiatives and can do all kinds of changes without each program having to figure out how to do it themselves. Our safety net program is one designed to kind of catch um, errors as they may happen. Uh, patients forget to go to the lab. Um, maybe their doctor put them on a medication that uh, is forgotten that uh, as the patient ages needs to be re-examined because it should be reconsidered in older people and that hasn't happened. So there's ways to catch these things and systematically put them in front of the uh, physician for a decision. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and I'm gonna wrap up here. This is just an example of what I was calling proactive care. And I talked about inReach. Um, a lot of care when you try and make initiative changes, there's a problem. If you don't have standard workflows and every doctor's office runs totally different, it makes system-wide change very hard. Standardizing the workflows um, actually makes it easier to put in a change in practice. Um, not separating primary and care Primary care and specialty care is also key. Primary care cannot do every um, initiative and patients, as I said, will go to a different department than you think about. So this is part of our system. Uh, next slide here. Just wanted to talk about leadership, which is part of the system and choosing wisely and a lot of these decisions we make on overutilization, it's really a quality issue, not a cost issue. I think one needs to lead from that viewpoint. Um, if you start having a lot of doctors over ordering things, that's either because there's a system problem, um, an incentive problem, which is part of the system, or simply um, poor cognition and poor reasoning which um, is part of a larger issue that may be impairing care, um, not specifically related to that overordering, but it, it's embedded within your care system and needs to get addressed. So I, what I'm advocating on a lot of these is treat the underlying cause and not the system. Um, it makes things more scalable. And I think I'm ready to wrap up here. Um, 
and wanted to thank a bunch of people. Uh, maybe Tony wants to do that. So um, I want to acknowledge the people on this slide for all of their help and involvement with the interventions that I've been involved with. Um, they've exchanged ideas, collaborated, refined projects so that the, the, these projects could be as safe and as effective as possible. You know, KP Southern California has the most amazing collaboration that's really hard to fathom, and we're a truly integrated system. Um, I also want to specifically personally express my deep gratitude to my chief who hired me and has always had his faith in me and his mentorship in getting me involved to improve geriatric care. He's allowed me to have the most meaningful jobs. Nancy Gibbs, who is our regional chair for geriatrics for Southern California Kaiser Permanente, who is involved in um, so many different responsibilities, and yet she was still able to work hand in hand with all the projects that I described, and to Michael Canner for his interest and support um, um, in allowing us to disseminate these projects throughout Southern California Kaiser Permanente. And on a personal note, I just want to thank my um, my family for their unflagging um, love and support to my parents who encouraged me to be the best physician possible. To my wife who has always encouraged me to get involved with my work even though it often meant sacrificing family time. And to my children, Caitlin, Ryan, and Cole, who along with Elaine has always been my source of inspiration. So thanks again, Tim and ABIM for inviting me to, inviting us to give this presentation. Thank you, Tony and uh, Thomas and uh, Michael for that presentation. I think we got a lot out of that. And I'm now going to introduce uh, Neil Shaw, uh, who is going to be a reactor. Um, Neil has been a partner of Choosing Wisely and the ABIM Foundation uh, since the beginning of the Choosing Wisely campaign. Uh, he is the founder and executive director of Cost of Care. He's assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, and he's the director of Delivery Decision Initiative at Harvard's Arianda Labs. And uh, I think uh, cost of care and our relationship with them has been absolutely uh, amazing what has happened in medical education at the uh, training level and at the uh, medical student level uh, regarding awareness of the issues and skills uh, to uh, reduce uh, low-value care, and uh, it's been um, uh, education for me about how uh, you uh, develop spread and uh, through social media and other means. So, Neil? Thanks so much, Daniel. Uh, you forgot to mention that I'm also an OBGYN, which is important context here because uh, the worlds of geriatrics and childbirth don't really uh, interact very often. Uh, so, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to listen and learn and react. Um, and Tony, Tom, and Michael, congratulations on the uh, Relay Race presentation. It was every, every element uh, uh, built from each other and was fascinating. I guess um, what I heard from Tony is that KP has a track record of thinking about harmful overuse in the geriatric population, to the extent that geriatrics is a relatively nascent field, but at least going from the late 90s until now, and that, um, you know, Tony and, and, and Tom, you, you sort of showed how a little bit more contemporaneously by taking uh, an existing decision support system and making it more guideline concordant, uh, you were able to um, potentially reduce harmful overuse in uh, diabetic patients. Um, and part of what that seems to demonstrate is that uh, uh, guidelines are important and decision support is important. Um, but then, Michael, you talked about how as you try to bring programs to scale across KP, these are only two elements of several uh, that, are, that are necessary. And um, part, I guess, of what was striking to me in um, hearing about how you're thinking about bringing these kinds of solutions to scale is the growing complexity of what you have to deal with, the number of conditions. Uh, and that seemed to be a common theme even with what I suspect underlies the hypothesis for why decision support alerts help geriatricians manage uh, or internists manage uh, uh, diabetic glycemic control, which is that they probably have a lot going on and they really rely on these alerts to be nudges amidst all the complexity. Um, so it's probably true at the clinician level, it's probably true at the system level that uh, complexity is a real barrier to uh, 
improving care and to uh, spread and scale. So I guess um, part of what I'm interested in, in hearing about is, uh, I guess, number one, um, how do you think about the opportunity for uh, necessary simplification as part of the solution, either at the clinical level or at the systems level? Um, and then as you think about spread and scale, to what degree do you feel that local context matters? And is there a mechanism or a way that you guys think about uh, adapting solutions to different types of contexts in order to make them more effective? You know, I think a couple thoughts is healthcare is inherently complex and I don't think any one person can master it. So a concept I like to think about is teamwork. And, and the system I was describing really allows uh, multiple people to do their aspect of the care that they're good at. And, and the key is to coordinate it so that the system becomes complex, but everybody's role in the system needs to be made simpler. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, I'm not saying it's the only way to do it, but that's the way I kind of think about it. Um, doctors will um, get alert fatigue. They won't respond to every single alert. Um, and so um, you can't just rely on creating guidelines and putting out best practice alerts and hoping things are going to work out because I don't think that becomes scalable. Um, it, it's really the teamwork, the subspecialization of different elements of care that can make it more manageable. I don't want to make say it makes it simple, but it makes it more doable. And, and Neil, um, for geriatric medication safety, when we focus in on a type of medication such as um, um, skeletal muscle relaxants, um, generally the way we disseminate um, um, our recommendation to try to stop prescribing muscle laxants in patients over the age of 65 is to go through the various chiefs groups that have involvement in it, from primary care physicians to urgent care uh, physician leaders to physical medicine physician leaders, and they will then discuss it um, um, to their departments throughout the different medical centers at KP Southern California. And all the um, different um, medical centers in KP Southern California also has a pharmacy um, um, lead who's in charge with making sure that, um, that the medications that are prescribed to our older adult members are appropriate and safe. And so they will look at whether or not which doctors are prescribing these skeletal muscle relaxants and, and counsel them along with their physician partner on um, medication safety uh, within that local medical center. You know, if I can add to that, one of the key things I didn't have time to go into when I talked about both um, information, uh, IT support and medication management is giving feedback on performance. So physicians are not only getting alerts, but they're also getting information on how well they're doing compared to their peers. Um, and I think that's a key element to um, to drive things. Most doctors will not have a great sense of how they're doing without the data given to them. I wanted to give a, um, uh, Beth and John an uh, opportunity to chime in with any comments from KP. Now, the, yes, I, apparently I was double muted. So now <laughs> the extra protection against unwarranted comments. Um, so I'll just say that um, I've, we've uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to work with Tony and um, and on a number of other things with Michael uh, to bring research into the mix. So, um, and I, uh, you know, I think the interesting thing that we're, that um, is an illustration of a, a learning health system, which many of us are really trying to, to go for, is that um, you, I think Tony's presentation was really terrific in terms of saying, here's all this literature that's out there that says what we should do. Um, but knowing what we should do and then figuring out how to do it, and Michael talked a lot about the how. How do you take that kind of information and bring it into a system and then, you know, try to drive it through, and that's a complex process. And, and then I would say more recently, we've been actively asking, well, did it, 
get us the results we hope for, you know, so what, so that we can continue to um, ensure that the, the things that we're doing are, are effective. And so this, you know, we have been um, doing work to try to answer the question, well, we had this idea about what would make a difference. Do we actually see any evidence that it makes a difference? And I think that bringing research in at different places along the way from the what should we do differently uh, to the implementation science piece to the evaluation of whether um, those changes are making a difference in patient outcomes or in the processes of care. I mean, the, the work we did just looks at whether um, the processes changed. We don't have quite enough experience to say anything about outcomes. And so I just want to um, kind of emphasize the, the contribution that research makes at each of those steps along the way and that um, integrating that more systematically, I think, will help um, not only our system, but other systems uh, learn from, from each other so that we don't each have to test every single every single thing. And I appreciate Neil's comment about um, context, you know, so certainly a lot of this is uh, dismissed as, well, that's just Kaiser Permanente. But I think there's a lot of things that we're learning that are um, quite a bit more generalizable than just, you know, what works inside our system, although we, of course, think it's special. So. Neil, any more comments? Well, maybe in picking up what Beth was saying a little bit, um, how do you think about um, the sort of blurry line sometimes between quality improvement and research, uh, particularly around this question about generalizability when you're trying to inform um, you know, people who may be listening to this webinar more broadly. And uh, in particular, I'm curious how you think about the, even the time and the cycling time for this, when you go from implementation to evaluation. Uh, often on the QI side, it's all about rapid cycle, 90 day PDSA stuff. And often when you're trying to infer causality and be generalizable, they're much longer cycles. So how, how do you think about that from right. a research point of view? So what we've been trying to, to work on um, in our different regions is um, something that I think is kind of in the, the middle of those two, so not quite as rapid as the QI cycles and quite a bit more ra rapid than the typical research cycles. Um, and, and, and I'll say a couple things. So we, we actually um, have done some work in my center to lay, to to do process maps on the research process to try to figure out how do we take out um, um, low value steps in the process so that we can, and, and where do we get hung up and how do we kind of move through, through things more quickly. And the partnership that we've had with Tony is a great example of engaging with a clinical champion who, and this is part of what we look for in the work we do, we're looking for someone who is in a position to um, make decisions based on the, uh, the information, but who's also a collaborator so that as we're trying to make some judgments along the way about the way the research is conducted, we have somebody that can titrate, if you will, um, uh, judgments we as researchers might make that um, we may not translate back into the system. And also, I, you know, I think one of the things that's really interesting when you work inside of a system as a researcher is the opportunity to hear from the front lines um, what actually is going on so that your interpretation of the data is appropriate. So, you know, uh, we, we may imagine some things about how care delivery is happening or what the data that gets populated in our electronic health record mean. Um, but there's nothing like talking to somebody on the front lines to discover, oh, that data element actually gets auto-populated. And so it doesn't really mean anything to the clinician or, you know, this is the way people are interacting with the system so we can do appropriate interpretation. So we're trying for faster cycles times. I think one of the things I've noticed, um, and we had a, a great example of this with um, the work we've been doing with Tony, is if you're engaged with a clinician along the way, that is, you know, I'd say a typical research approach is we go away um, in our cave and we do our work and then we have like the, what I call the big reveal. You know, we, we have our, you know, our bulletproof answer and we come back and tell you. The difference in the way that we're trying to work in this in this hybrid place in the middle is that because Tony's engaged all along, he gets to kind of see how things are going. So he gets kind of a sneak preview. He gets a sense. He gets an opportunity to think about, well, how, you know, so let's say we found out the alerts didn't make any difference. Then he might be thinking already about, okay, what will we need to do to change that to make it more effective? If he thinks they are effective, he might be thinking about, well, what are four or five other places that we could take advantage of, of this knowledge? So I 
think that's kind of the learning piece. And so I think, I think we need a lot more work in this middle space um, in order to move systems forward. Um, but I think it means both operational folks, clinical leaders, and researchers doing work differently than we typically have. But we're, we're actually doing that mindfully and proactively um, and, you know, still a lot of experimentation about how, how to make it happen. Um, but that's, that's kind of what we've been doing. Okay. Um, I want to, uh, I, uh, sorry, sorry, Michael, did you want to say something? Actually, it's um, John. It's John. I'm good. Please. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to chime in in response to the question about, you know, assessing the causation and that sort of thing. And the conflict between those sort of long time scale and doing fancy research style evaluation science and the quick and dirty shop floor um, kind of evaluation typically done in quality improvement initiatives. Um, and, I, and we're also working on speeding that up, you know, so when doing quality improvement, being able to do more rigorous evaluation, typically that's associated with taking a long time. Right? But in some ways, if you figured out how to do um, sort of more rigorous evaluation, like in this case, the evaluation model has some elements of regression discontinuity analysis, some elements of difference and differences analysis, and a lot of things you do if you brought the full A game to evaluation. That doesn't have to take any longer than a t-test if you're up and spinning and have the technology in place to do it. We're not all the way there yet, but I do think we can bring a, a more elevated game to the evaluation and the elimination of threats to validity uh, than is typically done in the quality initiative space. And, and that's one of our additional goals. Thank you. Um, I want to open it up. Uh, the, the way to ask a question uh, is in the chat room. Uh, that's one way. One way is just to speak up. And I wanted to ask a question of Kaiser. They probably have heard this question about 100 times in the last week. But um, I know culture um, is important. And uh, Michael Parchman writes about having uh, these kind of conversations, truth conversations. How much does that play into your thinking about quality improvement at Kaiser Permanente? Uh, is it just subliminal and you do it by uh, the culture that's uh, a part of uh, the fabric of KP or is there something more intentional? Uh, maybe I'll take a stab at that. I think if you aren't intentional about your culture, you get a default culture, um, which um, generally speaking is not optimal. So we um, have very specific um, onboarding of new doctors. We um, teach them the philosophy and the history and the culture of our institution and, and how we want to approach things. Um, we give them some grounding in what is evidence-based medicine, what's ethical practice, um, you know, those sorts of things. I, I think it needs to be heavily, um, I don't want to say managed, but it has to be managed in some kind of way or people will, um, that's part of the system they work in. That's, I think, key to actually getting people to work together and cooperate. And, um, I agree with what Michael said. And when I hire um, new general internists um, at Kaiser Permanente West LA, um, I talk to them um, almost immediately about the culture of yes. And, and they recognize um, that the interventions that we do, the, recommend, the recommendations that we make, it's always about patient care. And, um, and I think the new physicians as well as the older physicians, it's something that they all believe in, all the interventions that we are trying to embark on. Um, I want to again thank everybody. Neil, thank you for your questions and thank everybody at Kaiser Permanente and uh, this will be available on YouTube and other places as well. So again, thank you and uh, we'll be back in touch with our next uh, health systems leader group uh, along with Cost of Care and Academy Health. Thank you so much.